great to see so many people here um, who are interested in palliative medicine. I can see a few familiar, familiar faces. And um, I'm going to give a, a short presentation about um, something we've done in Manchester, where I work, called Surgery School, um, which um, I think is something that you could all take back to your hospitals and implement relatively easily because it's really quite simple. I don't think I could do it if it wasn't simple um, because that's what I am. So it's going to be really, it, I hope that this is going to be quite inspiring because it's something that we took on and we weren't sure how it was going to go. And in fact, it's been quite successful and a lot less hassle than I thought it would be. So I just want to tell you a little bit about surgery school, um, how we help patients get ready for surgery and um, also how that fits into perhaps the context of the clinical care pathways that we have in our hospital, which is similar, I'm sure, to many of the ones in your hospitals and, and indeed the one that Nick's just described. So, so what we've developed in Manchester um, is something called ERAC Plus. So we've taken some of the essential elements of enhanced recovery, ERAC, and then we've added a couple of things on which I'll explain to you why. One is something called ICOP, which is a respiratory care bundle um, with the intention of reducing post-operative pulmonary complications. Um, the other is what we've just heard about prehab and rehab, so prehabilitation, rehabilitation, increasing people's activity, um, and how we advise them about that. And then the last thing um, is, is an educational element, and, and it's said that there are, there are quite a few potential moments to teach people about improving their lifestyle and improving their health as they um, come in for surgery and as they can contemplate having surgery. And, um, and surgery school, we believe, is one of them. And so we give very general health advice to people, but I think it's um, quite beneficial for them as well. Um, I don't have any uh, interest to declare on, on this either. And, and really what we're talking about is the high-risk surgical patients. A lot of perioperative care is really focused on how can we improve outcomes for the high-risk surgical patients. And sometimes we're, we're not quite sure what, what that high-risk surgical patient is. Um, Rupert Pierce and, and other people have done quite a lot of research into it, big epidemiological studies. And what Rupert found in a study that was published over 10 years ago was it was these people like these two, when these two pitch up to your pre-op clinic, you kind of know that the major abdominal surgery, you, you know that, that it's not going to be necessarily an easy ride for them. Um, and these patients are people who are frail, we're going to hear more about frailty later, they have multiple comorbidities, and they often are suffering with cancer, that's why they're coming in for their surgery, um, and that surgery tends to be major body cavity surgery. And we know, of course, that emergency surgery is much higher risk. And um, one thing that I would say that I would add to Rupert's list, although it counts a little bit with the emergency, is that people who aren't prepared are at higher risk as well. So if you put all these things together, um, you can see what a high-risk surgical patient looks like. And in fact, we're probably quite good at managing comorbidities. I think in general in medicine, people with significant chronic comorbidities often have been managed quite well. So of all these things to try and modify, the only one that we're really not modifying at all at the moment that's modifiable is how well prepared people are for surgery. Can we get them fitter for surgery? And so that's what we, we recognize. And we also recognize that um, with ERAS, with enhanced recovery, uh, particularly if you look at the elements that are mainly um, to do with anesthesia, so we've heard about multimodal pain relief, um, all the talk about you know, fluid management, getting fluid management right next hypoperfusing or overloading patients, um, reducing the risk of post-op nausea and vomiting in areas so people can get <coughs> eating and drinking and then mobilizing, so it's the dream that we've just heard about. So we, we can, we're already there, but one, the, the, we felt that a couple of things that weren't happening for our very high-risk patients were, one was looking at trying to address post-op pulmonary complications, and another was looking at post-op cognitive dysfunction. So the first part of what I'm going to talk about and where we've come from is to actually reduce post-op pulmonary complications. Um, the definition of POPCs, um, there's been a, a number of different ones in different studies, it's slightly different in the States, but this is the European consensus uh, document, the EPCO um, consensus um, paper that didn't just talk about POPC but a whole bunch of outcomes following surgery. But in order to define a POPC, it was decided that you had to have essentially one sign of pneumonia. Um, <coughs> you could have
have atelectasis as well, so even if there wasn't signs of infection, if there were signs of atelectasis on a chest X-ray, signs of pleural effusion in pneumothorax um, is a POPC, but also, and then also increased respiratory support, so someone with a PO2 of less than 8 on room air or, or an equivalent FiO2 uh, PF ratio, so of less than 40. <coughs> also anyone who required uh, invasive or non-invasive ventilation. So these are the consensus description of post-op pulmonary complication. And when you want to look at well, what is the, um, what's the prevalence of this, well, it depends on the type of surgery and it depends on the risk factors. So um, the ARISCAT study, I don't know if any of you are aware of that, and um, the follow-up sort of validation studies of ARISCAT. ARISCAT um, was done in Spain, the Casas for Catalonia, um, and Cano and colleagues uh, published on this and, and they found sort of seven factors that were tended to be associated with or uh, with an increased risk of post-op pulmonary complications that they then turned into a score and that's low pre-op stats and that's stats on air lying flat, um, previous chest infection within a month, increased age, um, anemia which we've already heard about a little bit, um, major body cavity surgery, lung surgery and an emergency. And essentially, if you scored low and a low risk, probably about a 1% risk. But intermediate and high risk, using the Sariscat score, was approved is 13% for intermediate, 42% will get a POPC if you're high risk. And it turned out when we looked at it that, that, that almost all our patients that were coming to, say, critical care postoperatively fitted into that intermediate or high risk category. So, so we targeted that group of patients, so we, we kind of created this group of high risk, or we, we identified this group of high risk patients in our hospital who were all the ones coming to critical care post-op. And we decided some, to do something about their post-op pulmonary complications, and what we did was this package of care called ELS Plus, which involved as I've mentioned, this pulmonary care bundle called IHOP that they start before they come into in to their operation and continue afterwards. Um, advice around prehab, although we don't have a formal prehab class, we've got some resources to support this that people can see before they come into hospital. We have our professional group called Super Groups, which is a bit like a surgical MDT. <clears throat> and then we have surgery school, which is what I'm going to talk about today. But surgery school ties all this together because at surgery school, that's where we give advice about the activity in prehab. And it's where we start the process of getting people's uh, respiratory condition improved. And just over here, in fact, I've got a bit of a picture of her. This is Chrissy. She's one of our PAs. And so she's the person that really organizes surgery school. She gets the referrals. She is able to identify people who've had a CPAP test, for example. They all get invitations to surgery school. So she's managing surgery school. She also makes sure there's cups of tea and coffee for us and people are coming as well. And surgery school is an event not just for patients, but for their family, for carers as well. And it, and it encompasses people having a broad range of surgery. Um, so, you know, it's mainly cancer surgery, and I'll show you the breakdown of the type of surgery later. It's mainly cancer surgery, but we also have vascular patients and transplant patients coming uh, to, to surgery school. And we focus on a number of elements of health. And, and as I've done or given the surgery school or facilitated it, I've, I've increasingly realized that these are just, this is just really very good general health advice. And a lot of it, to be honest, applies as much to the relative as to the person who's actually um, coming for surgery because it's about good nutrition, it's about making cessation and other elements of respiratory health, it's about increasing activity. But then also there are some specific things that we talk about to prepare people for surgery. So we talk about analgesia and pain relief, we talk about the monitoring they're going to get. Uh, we, we give them a tour of the critical care unit so they actually get a feel of what that environment is going to be. And it gives them a chance to see what the staff look like and, and what the environment is that they're going to be in. And we also give direct them to the online resources that we've got as well. So that's what we do in surgery school. I'm going to go through, through it in a little bit more detail and show you some of the slides that uh, we actually show to patients. And then some of the little bit of the background evidence, I've taken quite a lot of the slides out because I know we're running, we've got to be tight for time. But this is one of the slides that um, we show, the fir one of the first slides we show to patients. And we try to explain, show them, this is, this, is, this is the journey that you're on. 
you know, to give them a feel of what it's about in terms of what they can be doing to get themselves ready for surgery. As you can see, you know, we, we are getting, um, encouraging increasing activity. We give this idea that they're training. Um, and then what happens during the surgery and anaesthetic, although they're often very interested in that, it's not something they can influence. They don't tend to go on about that. And then we talk about what they can do as they recover whilst in hospital and going home. And although it says going home in my enablement, um, <laughs> in fact, I learned a new term when I was there at a cancer meeting recently, which is they, they're having a riot. And that means return to intensive oncological therapy. Because most of these people who've had surgery, their journey hasn't stopped. They're, they're going to go and have a load of neoadjuvant chemo. And the sooner we can get them fit to have their chemo, the better their outcomes are going to be in the long run. And, and, and that's a really important point for them. And it's something that I didn't realize until you know, a few months ago, that it's not the end. It's not really the end of the, end of the you know, thing when they're back on the beach, but actually they're, they're having to go through more treatment, um, which is quite daunting for them. And I think we have to do as much as we can to support people through this very long journey. And so we, we make this kind of point, this is um, a slide we borrowed, a lot of this stuff you'll see we've been borrowed, you may have seen this before, the idea that you have your surgery in your sort of uh, functional state, reducing, and then you're recovering. And one of the points that, that I like to, I often make to people is, you know, you're going home, but you've still not got back to where you were before. So don't expect to be, you've got to, you, and you've got to get ready at home, so the things at home have food in make your friends and family aware that you're not going to be 100% when you get home, that you're still on that recovery. And, um, but, but what we want is you, for you to get back to your baseline and then have a couple more slides and say, what if you've got a complication? And obviously it goes right back and then it takes longer to recover and maybe they never reach their baseline. So we'll explain to people why avoiding complication is so important. And we'll also say to patients, well, you know what, you might be able to improve your baseline a little bit by doing these activities and, and getting yourself ready for surgery and that means you're less likely to get your complication and you're also more likely to recover quicker. And they kind of get that, even though it's sort of uh, not sort of highly scientific or anything, but they see they seem to get that concept. So that's quite good. And then we have um, obviously it's not it, although it's usually delivered it's delivered in a multidisciplinary way, so there's usually a, a doctor, you, one of the consultants, but sometimes we've got some of our trainees and we're looking to get a fellow, and we hope the fellow will be able to start delivering surgery school. But we also have a physio, so here's Siobhan, who's one of our physios, and Siobhan and, and her colleagues um, help deliver surgery school. And as I said, Chrissy's there, and we also have one of our HDU nurses that comes and, uh, and talks about the pain relief and gives them a tour of the ICU. And all the things we're talking about is fairly sensible. In fact, what we say is, look, it's like it's a major event. You know, it's not, and it's something that you can actually train for in the same way that if anyone else was trying to do, what decided to run a half marathon, they wouldn't just pitch up on the day of the half marathon. You'd be in training for it for weeks. And this is what we think you can do. So we talk about smoking cessation. We give some links to local smoking cessation um, teams um, and services. And we talk a lot about activity. And what we say is people, uh, one, something we found, we've been doing a little bit of work with um, psychologists, and they tell us that you shouldn't talk about exercise to people because it's like a big cut, it cuts a lot of people off. So the people who are into exercise are already doing it, and the people who are not into exercise don't even like the word. So we have to, we have to say, I uh, talk about activity, to say, well, whatever you're already doing, just try and double it. So if you're doing the gardening, double how much gardening you're doing. If you like going for a walk, play around the golf, whatever it is, do, do twice as much as what you were doing before. So we try and um, get people to increase, increase activity. The evidence base for it is a bit mixed, and I think we need to have more studies around rehabilitation and prehabilitation. So, for example, this is one, it's an interesting study from Canada, and um, this isn't in the surgery school presentation to the patients, I've just got to throw this in for you guys. Um, so this is a study from Canada where they did a, pre, a randomized control trial of either spinning, where they came into spin class and, and went on, on a bike, a static bike for a while, or they did kind of walking exercises. <coughs> In, in colorectal cancer surgery patients. And what they found was, because it was interesting, they found no difference between spinning and walking, mainly because there was pretty poor compliance 
uh, in both groups, so much so that it just caused great sort of contamination of the data. But what they found was if you lumped both the groups together and then said, what, how did people actually do when, when they prehabbed? You had about a third who got better, a third who engaged and were able to get better, a third who stayed the same, and the third who deteriorated. And they'd done some kind of psychological discussion and analysis of those people at the same time. And what they found was that the ones who deteriorated, they were a little, they were older, they had anxiety, and anxiety is quite a big issue because um, it stops people doing things. Um, they had a lot of anxiety, and they had a general disbelief that fitness, age recovery, right, it's not for me. And surprise, surprise, they were the ones who get complications, they were the ones who got stuck on ICUs, they were the ones who had the poor hospital outcomes. It was the ones who just didn't believe that, that, they was, that fitness was for them. And so there, you know, so so it's not simple prehabilitation. And I think, more, you know, studies that of prehabilitation, I think, have to have some kind of element of psychological support as well. Just my thoughts. So that's why I think this surgery school is it's a bit more holistic than just prehabilitation. And then I mentioned about the post-op pulmonary complication and the care bundle. So this is IPOP, and again, we didn't invent it. This was some sort of instinct of something so clever ourselves. It came from Boston, um, but we, but Boston allow, Medical Center allowed us to use it very kindly. And it's a simple acronym, um, and it's quite good because it's actually an acronym that means something about the thing it's about, which is unusual. So it's IPOP, and it's a restorative care bundle. And it's a combination of, as you can see, intensive spirometry, coughing, coughing and deep breathing exercises, oral health care, understanding, which is the educational element, getting out of bed, which is the M of dreams, which is mobilization, and then head of bed elevation, which we all do anyway in hospital. Now, so the IPOP, um, what we've done is we've taken IPOP and we use it on the ward, but also we give people the incentive spirometers in surgery school, and often they're getting them in their pre-op clinic as well now. And the reason we're doing that is because actually this is a reasonable evidence base for it. So here's a Cochrane database from 2015, 12 trials, and pre-op in surgery muscle training makes a difference. Whereas if you look at some of the look at the Cochrane review and some of the papers uh, around just incentive spirometry, where you give it to them at the you know day two for their operation, it doesn't make much of a difference. And and you can see that actually, I work in critical care and on HDU, you can see the patients who've been using their incentive spirometers beforehand. You know, you you say, oh, so you've got it going, have a go, and they'll have a go, and, it, and they'll maybe get two balls up, and you say, oh, all right, oh, two. Did you use it before? They said, oh, yeah, I was going to write three up before. And I said, well, you know, keep going. I'm sure you'll get back to it. Whereas the ones who maybe were emergencies or didn't, con you know, didn't get the um, <coughs> given incentive spirometer for whatever reason, it was like, no, nah, I can't do it. And, and that's, you know, and, and you can't, because they don't know what their baseline is and what their capabilities are. So actually, I think that's why it worked quite well preoperatively is because it, it, people know, know what they can do as well as actually probably, there is some evidence that will improve lung um, capacity as well for operative and spiritual muscle training. Okay, so oral hygiene, so this is part of one of our, part of our YouTube channel, this is the Professor of Dentistry who's giving a little talk about um, oral hygiene. What I tend to say to people is, well, you know what, it's, the, the bugs on your teeth are, and in your mouth are the same ones that cause the chest infection and the same ones that cause wound infections. So the best thing you can do is brush your teeth to kill the bugs, and you kind of get that. So um, we say use um, Listerine Zero, which is an alcohol-free mouthwash, obviously other mouthwashes, uh, which are publicly all available. And we, I advise people, although I don't know if they've ever taken me up on it, that if you haven't been to the dentist in the last six months, it might be worth making an appointment so that people can have a look and look at. And again, there's a reasonable evidence base for it. So the last time I was, I was in London, I had to go to the British Library to actually get the hard copy of this because I couldn't get it online. Um, if we could, hopefully my capture will pay for it, so I might as well get something back to the British Library. And um, here's this study, it's really good, it's from Australia, and they looked at mainly cardiac and thoracic patients, but they were able to show a reduction, not o in all nosocomial um, infections, but also deep surgical site infections, which I think are probably from the splenectomy wound, which I kind of shriveled um, a load of bacteria all over their splenectomy. 
So, so there is some evidence base for oral hygiene. And then, of course, our, you know, we've already heard about multimodal analgesia, and usually one of our nurses talks about analgesia because they're the ones that are really dealing with it. And, um, and what we do is we couch it in context of you need to mobilise because we've heard about the dreams, but mobilisation is so important, and mobilisation reduces delirium as well and helps help with cognitive dysfunction. So I tell people that about why mobilisation is so important. So my last couple of slides. We realised after having set up and devised surgery school, we realised that we hadn't actually got any expertise um, to help us deliver it in a, in a sort of, sort of evidence-based way from a psychological viewpoint. And by complete luck, it turned out that Rachel Powell, who did the Cochrane database on psychological preparation and surgery, works about 200 metres from where I do. Um, and so we've managed to meet up with her and we're doing some work with her about surgery school where we're going to get one of her MSc students to interview patients who've been to surgery school and we're going to interview some of the staff who deliver it as well. Um, but what Rachel and her team found that there were sort of four main elements to preparing people psychologically for surgery. Um, talking about the procedure, um, there are cognitive interventions that you can do to, to, for people with very high levels of anxiety as well as relaxation techniques. Um, and then emotion focused interventions so you can sort of say don't feel scared, don't feel angry and, and how you deal with that. And, that's, um, and that again is shown to reduce length of stay. So we're trying to embed that into surgery school but we're doing it a bit retrospect retroactively. And so here you can see there have been, been over 400 now, we're well, well into the over 400. Uh, the, the majority of probably cancer patients, upper GI, hepatobiliary, colorectal, but then a smattering of others as well. And the outcomes, so we just had this published in anesthesia, and um, this is looking at post-operative pulmonary complication rates. And I actually, we actually, I show this slide now in surgery school to show to people that this thing is working, this idea is working. So here's 20% just about the post-op pulmonary complication rates. You'll remember for the intermediate and high risk, it was 14 and 42%. So we were probably about where you'd expect us to be with a 20% POPC rate for major abdominal surgery. And over time, since 2013 when we started, we repeated it and it was still high. Then we started the program and we've been able to reduce it and, and, and keep it down at about under, just under 10%. And so we do feel that the whole program has helped. Surgery school is part of that. It's a key part of that, and it's one that I honestly believe you, you know, any of you can deliver in your hospital um, with, with not that much um, time and effort. And we're, we're developing a toolkit to, so that you, know, you can take some slides and then, and then modify it as you need to. So we're developing a toolkit that you, you know, anyone is welcome share. And so I just want to acknowledge all these people because I'm, I'm not, I wasn't even the lead of it. John Moore is the main person who's, who's led on this, but I've been quite heavily involved in helping develop it. And, um, and I just want to thank you for listening and I'm happy to take some questions. <laughs>